Hey everybody, it's Steve with Real Progressives. Bringing Nate in. How are you, sir? I'm all right. Doing all right this fine weekend. Well, I tell you what, it's been a while since we've had you on, so I'm really excited about having you back. Um, you came today with a subject that I am not as familiar with as I would like to be. So I'm excited because I'm going to be learning. This is all learning for me. The subject tonight is really rent control. And, you know, this is something that you came. It's an extremely important topic, obviously. And I feel terribly neglectful not having at least had some understanding of it. So why don't I allow you a moment to tee the subject up for the audience and we'll go ahead and dive in. Um, so as you, as some of the people who are more you know, avidly following every possible drip of MMT news out there might be aware, uh, one of the presentations I did at the MMT conference was about housing and about, uh, about affordable housing. And what I said there was, you know, you have the crowd of all the people in the Modern Money Network, people like Rowan, people like Raul, and we talk about the usual topics. We talk about money and credit. We talk about finance. We talk about the job guarantee. We talk about all these issues. But the thing that we talk uh, talk about that's closest to what's going on in our every day-to-day -day lives, especially as predominantly people in New York City, is the rent. What a, is, uh, How many bedrooms in an apartment? What the rent is? Are rents going up? rent increases because, you know, as, as anyone who's living their lives knows, housing is the biggest cost that they face. And despite this wild importance, housing doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. And it's especially unfortunate because housing is one of the places where the, the, the ideological apparatus of economics, the the, the push, what with the propaganda that gets put out is is most forcefully applied to economics, and there's much more effort. There's the most effort in making sure that there's ideological conformity on rent control among economists. If you poll economists, it some like 92, 93 percent of of economists say that rent control is you know by definition horrible has no positive effects whatsoever and yet the evidence for that at best is incredibly incredibly weak and so and i think to me i think this is especially since we're thinking in terms of we're starting talking about guaranteed right to a job and getting that to the basics that you need to live a life we need to start dealing with housing and how housing works in the United States and other societies today. Okay, so, you know, in looking at this, one of the things that you had raised to me was basically saying the textbooks that, that, our, um, uh, that our, our students are taught from, if you will, completely and utterly destroy the concept of rent control. They absolutely butcher it. Can you address the standard fare and then what the reality is? Yes. So any, as you know, you might think, looking around your your city or your community, that real estate, that uh, rent, that housing is a very complicated topic that needs you know specialized understanding, data, skills to understand. But uh, <laughs> but as uh, but but. In, in, in actuality, the way it's approached in economics textbooks, it's treated as just any other market. You know, the, the beauty of mainstream economics is you can draw uh, a, a, you can draw a sideways cross. You can draw an upward sloping line and a downward sloping line, and they intersect at one point and say, this can explain what's going on in any market. And they do that also for uh, for housing. And rent control is a text is the textbook example of basically how you know bleeding heart liberals don't understand how markets, how money works, and do counterproductive things. So the idea is that rent and 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 it's it's so bad that what they call rent control has no connection to any actually existing rent control in any place on the planet and has it for decades and decades. In, in, in the textbook, rent control is that suddenly a city decides to 
uh, to cap the rent at a certain level or even lower uh, the rents that uh, home that uh, landlords can charge, and they just and they just keep it there, and it applies to all bill all currently constructed buildings uniformly, and then they have some you know explanation for why that's terrible. On all actually existing rent control, rent control first of all applies to uh, pre-existing buildings. For example, in New York City, I think it applies to buildings uh, built before 1973, and it's not a you know cap. It's a we are re- we we are limiting how fast you can increase the rent uh, on a yearly basis. And we have a rent control board and yada yada, but. The, the way rent control as a, what's called the second generation of rent control works has no relation to any of the economist discussions were mostly implemented in the 60s and 70s if not earlier and the textbooks and and main and you know normal intro microeconomics textbooks st- uh, act as if none of this history exists and have blanket denunciations of rent control so let me let me ask you then the next question is you know why do you suppose that the concept of rent control is important as like an economic policy i mean because honest to god I, I nathan i could be wrong but my guess is based on the people that that come to real progressives most of them are res- are living in a life that is directly impacted by rents going up they're directly impacted by cost of living going up. So this subject, at least at a personal level, I would think would resonate with them. Why would it matter to economists? Why are economists not doing more to talk about this, et cetera? Well, there's multiple. I mean, one the sort of more cynical reason is uh, landlords are extremely powerful and have extremely powerful organizations and, of course, Land and, uh, and and home ownership is also deeply connected with the financial system. So there's a lot of very powerful interests that are interested in in housing and any and and, and since you know we, we talk a lot about financial assets and financial assets are important and they're important contribution to net worth and understanding financial net worth as financial assets minus financial liabilities is important. But uh, corporations, businesses, even banks also have all all non-financial assets and the most important non-financial asset is buildings and land Uh, buildings and land at their at their market price are worth you know wildly more than any other non any other category of non-financial assets combined uh and so there's a ton of wealth riding on this and you know i it would be interesting to have a study on this on how much of of housing of housing research is directly or indirectly financed by by financial insurance and real estate but so the, the one is that there's there's a much more direct and immediate interest in get, in having everyone follow a specific ideological line in this area of economics than almost any other and the less the the less you know cynical or you know class reason uh that I would say is uh because if there's so few areas in society where, uh, where people where there seems to be an, a direct repudiation of what economists say is appropriate economic policy, that it triggers, for lack of a better term, economists intellectually, and creates a very strong response from them. I mean, even Paul Krugman, admittedly, it's this op-ed as many years ago. But even Paul Krugman has a, has an op-ed from 2000, um, basically regurgitating the basic textbook position on rent control for New York Times readers. It's 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 just it's it's something that's in the water. It's you know you you might be able to come up with sort of complicated exceptions to mainstream textbook mainstream economics and all sorts of other different categories, but nearly everyone is on side when it comes to rent control. And what's so striking is everyone's on side when it comes to rent control without really and when they're when when their strongly stated criticisms aren't really uh, related to the actual evidence that even mainstream economists have accumulated. Uh, in one of the few journal articles that really take this issue as a whole head on, called Time for Revisionism on Rent Control, and 
written 1995, the conclusion is, nevertheless, the case against second-generation rent controls is so weak that economists should at least soften their opposition to them. A degree of revisionism is certainly in order. And this is from a mainstream economist who's you know, very much inside the tribe, just looking around it and saying, just from what the evidence that we have, the way we see the evidence, the arguments against currently existing rent control is so weak. Um, well, I, I want to ask you a question. You know, I was reading um, uh, Roman Chuck's bond economics. Uh, he, he was talking about uh, Bitcoin and so forth. And one of the things that jumped out at me that has nothing to do with Bitcoin whatsoever is the idea that our country used to sell bonds, that people could buy these bonds, and they grew at a fairly stable or you know increasing inflation rate that allowed them to have money later in life. It was it was one of the things that any of our parents grew to you know use as as a survival tool. And you know, in looking at you know non-sovereign entities like New York City, Los Angeles, wherever, in places where there is extremely high rent, San Francisco, Miami, whatever. You know, these are places where I would think that the, the state or the locality could invest in types of bonds to offset the cost. What, 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 are, what are they doing? What are local communities doing to assist regular people to overcome these issues? Well, I mean, we should say that, you know, despite what economists near universal opposition, uh, rent control a form of rent control was implemented in many cities in 1960s and, and 1970s. Um, that's been pushed back against uh, some, and rent control certainly hasn't been expanded since those initial impl uh, implementations, but there is still a response um, in all sorts of ways. The issue is that the response is very you know, market-friendly, market to, to, to use the, the favorite phrase. So, one of the biggest things, something that uh, Mayor de Blasio is famous for, but goes back to Mayor Bloomberg before him in New York City and uh, in other places, is Mayor uh, is is they've approached. Well, you can build your nice, fancy, high-rise building and rent at whatever you want and have luxury rents, but we want 10, 15, 20 percent. You know, basically, we we want you to have a chump change of apartments that you rent at quote unquote affordable rents. And this is, you, you know, kind of the burden that we place on you in exchange for giving you a permit to construct. And, you know, that's better than nothing, but it is, you know, chump change in, in the larger context of affordable housing. And often rents are so, uh, are so high in, you know, in market rents are so high that what's called affordable uh, rent is not something that someone making that a family making say seventy thousand dollars could really afford, and, and so the definition, especially in places like New York City, of what is affordable housing get get crazy in and of themselves. So okay, so I guess this kind of leads us to that next question, which is, what is the second generation of rent control? It seems like you're kind of touching on it now already. Yeah, what is that so, involved? So there's art. So especially around World War II, um, but but also World War One, there was kind of faster, uh, more immediate responses that we needed to stabilize housing right right now, and and imposing rent control, uh, you know, just 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 straight up caps. There wasn't as much time spent in actual design, um, and. And, or, or at least that's what I, that's what I've seen. I, admittedly, I do think that what, "quote unquote" first generation rent control needs to reassessment too. But let's take that as given. So there was, you know, all sorts of arguments about the about negative effects that had on maybe uh, uh, landlords, especially small landlords, not having enough for maintenance, um, not having enough for uh, to. To, to do the sort of basic things that they need to do, that it would have these negative impacts. So when when it came around in the in the late '60s, when there was a real push about uh, about housing again in the early '70s, uh, they what they did is rather than uh, just rather than having wholesale 
you know, the rents can only be this maximum for this amount of bed, for this square foot, or uh, can only, uh, or some kind of sort of thing that's supposed to apply to all housing. Uh, it only applied to pre-existing housing. And the reasons that are important is if I construct a building now, I have a ton of upfront costs and essentially I'm supposed to be recouping that cost either by selling it to someone who then recoups those costs through rents over the years or I just recoup it through rents over the years myself. So uh, the idea is if you impose, if, if you impose some or lower uh, rents by essentially government fiat uh, when, uh, on newly constructed buildings that you have sort of an impact on construction. But if you impose rent control on a building that is, uh, that is pre-existing and, and, and essentially establish that you're not going to, uh, that, that any building uh, won't have these kind of controls put on, on say the first 20 years of construction, then it doesn't necessarily have an impact on future construction and so a lot of and then a lot of the arguments that economists make against rent control are based on uh, rent control de-incentivizing building new housing and thus creating creating even more housing security. And the second piece is rather than just having these fixed caps, they're more like like a profit control rather than just a straight up price control in that they allow the price the rents to be increased for certain upkeep and maintenance costs that can be documented by the landlord as actually increasing. So the idea is that between actually providing an uh, in incentive to have a certain quality of housing and allowing them to increase rent for certain for for how for upkeep and maintenance costs and not having it apply to new housing that you weren't having an effect that you were lowering rents for people and ensuring that that a certain group of people had. Uh, stable access to these apartments, uh, to to these older apartments, without disincentivizing new new construction and without making the how without making letting the older housing deteriorate faster than it would otherwise deteriorate. So I want to ask you a question that's out of script here, real quickly. Sure. Obviously, broken windows uh, policing was a big deal. Um, throughout the uh, New York City area in particular. It kind of um, took on a life of its own and then it kind of went around the nation. And you, know, you see the over-militarization of our police forces and the over-policing and so forth. What do you suppose the high rate of rent does to crime um, in, in these major metropolitan areas where it becomes too expensive to live on the up and up? Um, I, I think actually the, the biggest effect it has is people's lives in the workplace and people's personal lives, that there is some evidence that, that but, and from a commonsensical point of view, if you can potentially uh, leave and leave uh, an abusive relationship or leave an abusive household and potentially get a job or get some part-time gigs and be able to, you know, afford to split an apartment with some people, you can, there, there's, there's only a certain amount of, of abuse you'll take. Not, not always, but often. Um, and, uh, and that's not a universal statement, but that applies to a lot of situations. And the more, the higher rents are relative to median income or just, or just what, what, an income you can typically realistically get, um, especially as like maybe a single mother or a single person or someone who's been out of the workforce for a while, that the, the higher rents are relative to that, the more that people are willing to tolerate abusive relationships when they think the alternative is extreme housing insecurity. And that the same thing is when, they, when they'll tolerate a, uh, abuse on a job. Uh, especially what they think of as as a decent job, that these kinds of these kind of pressures, and since rent is just so central to that, especially rent, um, they have all these effects on on these kind of interpersonal things. I do think, of course, you know, to the extent that rent increases and uh, lack of access to affordable housing uh, makes people. Uh, makes people it impoverishes people who wouldn't otherwise be impoverished because of their unemployment uh, or because of their 
or because of their low wages, wages low really, wages relative to what that that it can, you know in, in, to the extent it increases poverty, poverty can uh, can intensify those kind of criminal aspects. But I think the more pernicious thing is the things that people to- will tolerate in their personal lives from other people and from uh, bosses uh, when it when when leaving an apartment. Uh, and leaving, you know, someone else's economic support just seems completely uh, unimaginable, and high rents are essential to that. So, where where am I going to find the most affordable housing in an area like this? I mean, what what how if it even exists? Where do I how do I find that? I mean, what, where, where is that going to be located? So, one of the one of the, the important things to think about. Um, in terms of housing is because housing is mostly long-lived construction. It's, it's something you build that you might be planning on getting a return over 20, 30 years, but it, it could exist for, you know, 75, 100 years. There's plenty of, you know, uh, they've been renovated for the most part, but plenty of 75 and 100-year-old uh, apartments in New York City. And so, and, and as a result, most, to the extent that the, well, we won't necessarily say affordable housing, but the lowest rent housing tends to be old, unrenovated housing. So, the main source, especially in you know, in, in the United States, where public housing construction you know, basically hasn't happened in, de- in decades upon decades upon decades, for the most part, uh, the main source is just uh, kind of aging into housing. That, that that housing gets you know old and more decrepit, and someone's already recouped their capital costs, and you get some new speculator who is willing to you know uh, maintain the apartment building on their own on the on the cheap, and they they buy in, and it's this older building that someone else is selling out of them, and it becomes you know it becomes a source of a lower of lower rent housing when it was newly constructed. It was more likely rented to high income or higher income people. I mean, a lot of the apartments that even in the, in the U S in, in New York that you would think of as like, you know, as, as you would identify as, you know, cheap housing because it's decrepit were these like gorgeous, gorgeous uh, apartment buildings or townhouses that were the height of luxury decades and decades, even in, into the 1920s. So it's important to understand that, you know, for all the for all the conversation about new construction and obsession with new construction, which to a certain extent I understand, that new construction, for, realistically, for the most part, isn't an even theoretically possible source of housing besides, you know, the, the hand fills that the, that the government or that uh, cities require them to make available until 30, 40 years. So your whatever incentives you put into construction, unless it's building public housing right now, under the current regime, basically has no direct effect on the supply of affordable housing. And it's very debatable whether it has any indirect effect at all. And, and if it has an indirect effect, that might even be negative. So let, let's, let's peel back the onion, because right now, obviously, we're talking about local and municipal type laws. Um, yeah. how, how could we address this at a macro level to provide micro incentives or to, in fact, subsidize? Is there an MMT solution here at a national level that bypasses uh, the normal local? I mean, what do we have here? I mean, we've got a lot of options, I would imagine. Uh, have any of them been explored? Okay. So one thing is, of course, built is just straight up building mass public housing. That 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 and, and 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 that can be a wider debate about the, the advantages and disadvantages of public housing, or at least say public housing construction, if the, if if nothing else, that that is the kind of most main direct way uh, to deal with housing issues, especially federal uh, the, the federal government dealing with those housing issues. I mean, you can do it in a job guarantee way. You can say federally funded, locally administered. You can have, you know, I live, as I think I've talked about a little bit on this uh, show before, I live in a limited equity co-op, which was, had uh, public financing involved, but it's technically uh, owned by the people who occupy apartments. 
uh, and they own the right to live there and they own the right to sell that right back to the co-op at an administered price, but they can't sell that. I can't sell this apartment on a market um, that you can you can provide public funding for those kinds of structures. And that's that's kind of the ideal uh, in terms of in terms of what the federal government could do. But the thing is, you still need access to vacant lands to build that public housing. And it's in, in the in the in the United States context, it still involves uh, dealing with municipal and state authorities. Other places have federal have federal planning systems uh, for dealing with housing. Places like Germany, um, which I think have a, have a lot that to speak for them, um, and they also have own the federal government or, or also owns a lot of vacant land that is uh, adjacent to cities in which they can use to ex uh, expand public housing. But I think that uh, I think that federal funding is, of course, the most important. But it has to be tied with uh, local political initiatives for for affordable housing and an organized constituency of local people interested in 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 having clean, accessible housing and ensuring the quality of that clean, low cost, accessible housing. Very, very good. All right, so let's let's go back to one more thing. I, I, I understand um, the vast majority of uh, individuals think with their own pocketbook, and these policies may seem out of line, if you will, with the way they understand economic narrative. How does a place like Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, or Philadelphia, or, or anywhere else like that. How do they institute uh, you know, these kinds of policies? I mean, they're they're, they're strapped, they're trapped to a tax dollar, a bond, something, right? I mean, it, for them to achieve anything, they've got to have some sort of funding. Uh, and and what happens, uh, at least as the way I've seen it, when you raise the the taxes in these local areas, people flee to the suburbs. Um, and then all of a sudden your tax base is gone and you're left with the poor trying and carry the weight. Now, somewhere like New York City, obviously, that's the epicenter of finance and, you know, and so forth. The people are not going to flee there. Maybe they do. I mean, what do you do with the flight of, of the wealth when, when you raise taxes to achieve these things? It seems like there's got to be a better way. So on the tax issue, I would say that I think – my opinion is that the, is flight is a, is somewhat exaggerated. That there were structural reasons uh, about uh, regarding especially white flight in the 1960s and early 70s that weren't really about taxes because you were having high taxes in these places through the 30s, uh, 40s, or 60s. And yes, there were some people who were who who were leaving, but that uh, that there were, there were structural factors and social factors in addition to their you know technical personal pocketbook factors that. Uh, pushed for flight at those particular times, especially, of course, the the value of, you know, pres preserving their, their capital value in, in their housing. And there was a, you know, a systemic apparatus um, in term in uh, to take advantage of people scared by housing, even just slight, small incremental housing desegregation. Um, I don't think that is quite the context that we are in right now, and this. But the second piece I would say is that it's true that uh, local and municipal gov government uh, governments can't create the United States dollar, but uh, zoning the power and the power of zoning and deciding what gets built where and what you can uh, uh, rent it in an area or how rents are determined in an area is extremely powerful. Um, Land values are tied to the expected, you know, future income that you can get from uh, from uh, from that from that land or building something on top of it uh, within some, over some you know short time horizon, say three, four, five years, maybe even a little bit longer. And zoning has a powerful impact on the on people what on, on those land values. And frankly, I think that and and so local governments have the ability to they don't have the ability to uh, create money and, and or create US dollars but they do have the ability to create 
monetary value in the sense of that their zoning policies can create trillions of dollars of uh, of especially in a place like uh, Manhattan, can create trillions of dollars of land value overnight, and it can also take away land value uh, in those zoning policies. Well, one thing, if you want to put it in the links, uh, is is my more technical presentation on uh, an, an, an overview of housing issues uh, from the MMT conference, um, planning for housing affordability, sketches of a heterodox approach. And in that, w w the main thing I discussed, which is mo more a provocation policy than anything else, is what I call rent control zoning. So the big, one of the biggest issues with rent control is what's called economic eviction. The idea that there are, are difficult but, uh, but available legal mechanisms and also some not legal mechanisms uh, by, of scaring people or getting people out of rent controlled or rent stabilized uh, tenants out of, the, out of uh, housing in order to be able to sell the housing to some, some developer to knock the buildings down or simply to just rent to a higher to a, a clientele who can afford much higher rents, and economic evictions are one of the big things that undermine uh, the the benefits that rent control can provide. But the reason that that's possible is the fact that they still have a property right; they have a legal right that if the apartment is vacant, they can rent it to a to a new person at a new uh, at a new rent at a new uncontrolled base rent or even just a new uncontrolled rent altogether, or that they have the right to sell the, apart sell the apartment to someone who's going to live in it. Or do they, they have all these associated property rights that give them a strong incentive legally or legally to clear someone out. That's you know, for, referred to as economic evictions. You know, because, because the, vow, the price of the, of the housing has gone up or the rent has gone up, the market rent, if I can just clear out the rent control people, I can or rent regulated people, I can you know make a quick buck. Well, if you zone in such a way that there's a maximum uh, rent per square foot, or however you want to determine that, and you and, and that's only adjusted for uh, some index of maintenance or some you know proven documentation from the landlord of maintenance cost increases or uh, uh, what is it? Uh, maintenance cost increases or upkeep uh, cost increases well then they don't there's not anything else that they can do with it so there's no that since since the since it's the air it's the area it's the it's the underlying land that has actually had its rent controlled rather than of the actual building or just for the tenant or occupant, you've strengthened the, the renter, essentially you've strengthened the renter property rights for the area that you've, that you've zoned. And that can go a long way of being able to create affordable housing without having to go on a, on a big construction boom. And then the flip side is that you can use your zoning powers to create you know, pockets of luxury real estate where the attraction is that you have access to these only limited areas in which we allow uh, in, in, in which we allow luxury real estate, and then you apply some sort of land value tax on those areas, or some sort of capital gains tax, and so that you can, you know, create an environment that is amenable to luxury housing and to the rich, but use it as you know some place where you can siphon off value uh, to do whatever further uh, spending increases, uh, spending increases you need to do on the affordable housing side. Um, that said, it's what I'm talking about is budgetarily much different than tax the rich to, you know, uh, give subsidies to, uh, housing insecure people, but it's also much more politically uh, contentious because you're, I'm striking much more deeply at, uh, what, Property holders, property holders, and real estate holders believe are their fundamental rights, and so you, you you can't do that kind of thing without a huge political movement. But I think, to me, that's that 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 is a plus, not a negative. That we need to be having these kinds of conversations of what actually are the rights of property holders, of real estate holders, and and to the extent that that the current distribution of rights. You know, leads to 
uh, mass housing housing insecurity, and of course, tens of thousands of homeless people do the do the property rights that currently exist, and you know the trillions of dollars of land value in a, in places like New York City or and or San Francisco do their do their right to uh, th- those mass amalgamations of uh, monetary value do their rights to to that really outweigh the rights of everyone else in those societies. And I, I, I feel comfortable or at least happy to be having that kind of a debate rather than a debate about uh, how, you know, necessarily uh, any, any form of rent control will necessarily kill the supply of housing and, you know, cause, you know, mass ma- uh, maintenance, uh, mass maintenance, you know, spending cuts that you know makes things things worse for the poor and that and that and to, to focus that literally it actually is the maximal amount of property rights we give landholders and building owners uh, that is actively disrupting the livelihoods of everyone else in uh, in cities which of course are the dominant uh, dwellings uh, the, the dominant place of of living conditions for most Americans. So let, let me ask you this question. You know, we talk about health care as a right. We talk about water as a right. Water is life. We talk about all these things that should be rights. And I mean, they're just should be's, right? They should us. And, uh, you know, I would consider shelter to be, you know, one of those type of uh, things that should be a right. We should have it as a right. Um, And yet at the same time, though, municipalities are not, I mean, maybe they're trying not to compete with the private sector, so to speak. But why in the world wouldn't we take rundown buildings that have long since uh, given up their ghosts, maybe they're uh, condemned, that we could renovate, um, et cetera? Why are we not going out there and doing that sort of thing. It seems like that is as much a right as healthcare, is it not? Absolutely. Uh, I, it, I think fundamentally it literally is that anything that, that anything is seen like that comes across as any kind of encroachment on private property rights is, uh, and, and, and business pro- and business uh, property rights is seen as a fundamental violation. So for example, why do we grant indefinite deeds? Why would we grant someone the ability to own a piece of land for theoretically, you know, thousands of years and beyond into the future, but practically over hundreds of years? Well, it's because if you if it was if a if a land if a land deed or owning your house was you know some thirty year thing, uh, that would seem like a fun that that was you know renewable up to you know the up to some other consideration that wasn't just purely your decision making, it would seem, you know, outrageous, like a fundamental encroachment. And the idea that property owners, if they buy a, a buy property and or buy housing that they don't plan to live in, the idea that they should be able to own that stuff into the infinitely in the future, um, it, it creates a stability and you know, you know cultural power to property rights that wouldn't exist if say when you, when a developer builds a high rise building they owned that building for 30 years and then the ownership reverted to the tenants of that high rise building uh, which you know there's no reason there's no economic reason why that wouldn't still create incentive for construction you you'd still get 30 years of uncontrolled rents that 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 would get to you but it would just be at the end you know, this is these are going to revert to you know, you know, communally owned or some sort of ownership structure where they become it becomes directly affordable housing. But you know, thirty years, well, that's close to twenty. That's if you're limiting me to thirty years, what's going to stop you from limiting me from twenty years? What's going to stop you from limiting me from tw- ten years? What's going to stop you from appropriating my property right now without any compensation? And that's communism. So when, when you make any discussion about any marginal abridgment to property rights, um, it becomes about uh, the, the, the logical extreme of that. And of course, you know, especially in a place like the United States, where is a is a home ownership society, many people, you know, they 
just like people are temporarily embarrassed millionaires, they're mm -hmm. also temporarily embarrassed landlords. And anyone who owns their own apartment, even if it's on a heavily a more uh, heavily mortgage, you're thinking like, but maybe, maybe like, you know, something happens, something's better at work, I get this promotion, maybe I can afford a second mortgage and buy a bill, buy another apartment, and now I'm, uh, now I'm a mo quote unquote mom and pop landlord. And so it's part of that sort of ideology. And of course, in other places where the property rights of renters is much stronger and uh, the property rights, of, for lack of better, the property rights of, of other owners of lands and buildings is, is less, or, or at least that renters have property right to homeowners, a place like Germany, uh, rent, the people who rent is a much higher percentage of the society. And homeownership is much less popular. All right, I'm, I'm going to try and build something here real quick and tell me if I'm crazy. Yeah. So yeah. understanding MMT, the government, by imposing a tax, has in essence created unemployment, to quote Mosler. As you weed through the hierarchy of that, you go into the fact that our government still uses the non-accelerating, you know, NARU to keep people unemployed, to create scarcity, to keep inflation down, whatever. So if government created unemployment through taxation, and then it still tries to keep a certain number of people unemployed, when you have rents in these areas that are too damn high, uh, you know, all of a sudden you've created a situation where you are, you're guaranteeing crime, you're guaranteeing people are going to suffer, and it's purposeful and it's driven by our government. I, I, am I in any way, shape, or form off here, or, or have I scratched the surface of something? And then one thing that I think MMA, that Modern Money Network has pushed, and Rowan and Raul's pushed, and that we've been expanding as a narrative is uh, the you know, there's two types of major types of obligations that governments impose. They impose taxes, they impose taxes, fines and fees, these just direct monetary obligations. And they also impose the obligation to respect someone else's property rights. And it's really those two together that create unemployment. You know, in other places, you know, when there were all series of public pro uh, property rights, you know, fam most famously around enclosure, well, you you were saved from the labor market to a certain extent, maybe not the whole extent because of uh, monetary taxes, but to a certain extent because you had access to subsistence through the, your public property rights. Once those are taken away and you move to a system of pure private property rights where you don't have any sort of direct legal right to subsistence, uh, that much more forcefully drives people into the labor market and makes them permanent uh, workers rather than sort of seasonal workers or temporary workers. And I, so I would say that, you know, MMT, that the, the broader sort of legal M M MMT position is that it's the imposition of obligations that, uh, and, and, and then lack of sufficient spending and lack of, you know, sufficient, you know, planning for housing uh, creates, uh, creates uh, homelessness and unemployment, and that the government has a dual obligation through creating a job guarantee, but also through uh, its, pub its public planning apparatuses that uh, affect uh, land property rights in all sorts of ways to eliminate unemployment and also eliminate homelessness at the same time. And that these, these two things go together, and that the big difference is simply that especially in, a, in the way the, the United States government uh, works with its local, state, uh, federal system, uh, that, the, that, that eliminating homelessness is going to involve much, uh, much more involvement of, and much more direct involvement in planning of local, local municipal and state governments than, uh, than a job guarantee necessarily will, although it will still evolve, involve some planning from municipal and state governments. And that 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 it, and that it's and that, that really it's that difference and that difference is really just a matter of of emphasis and a matter of administrative responsibility. So, you know, one of the one of the things, and and we're coming up on the time, so I don't want to take yeah. you too far over, but I do want to ask point blank: in a situation where we've got people who are obviously incapable of taking care of themselves in a non-regulated uh, dog-eat-dog world, especially in an area like uh, New York City. What, if any, 
recourse do they have today? Forget all the economic implications. What, if any, legal implications do they have today to, to demand survival? Or are they just like out on the street? They're, in, currently, they're under the current legal system. They're out on they're out on the street. Uh, and I would recommend actually that you ch- check out a, tra- uh, a trailer that came out that I came across yesterday of a new movie um, called The Public that'll be coming out next year that I think deals with these issues very deeply. The most most of what to the extent that there's any support provided and any major support besides you know the limited capacity of homeless shelters that are provided to pe- people with extreme housing insecurity, it's the public library. The public library is the last bastion left. Um, it's a place that you can go as soon as it's open and you can spend your time in a cold in a cold day when it's warm. But especially, but the public library closes and you can still freeze to death. Uh, on the street that night and that movie is has has that plot at the center of it and just from the trailer i can say that the trailer itself is very powerful and i think the movie's being powerful but that's really the reality of of what we're talking about and i uh mmn and all and uh and the associated lawyers around us are interested in uh pushing forward legal doctrines in terms of the demands that you can make, but in terms of the current concrete realistic reality that you're facing, the, the legal, the, the only legal right you, you have is basically, um, especially at night, you know, at, at, at 1 a.m. On a, on a cold night like it was yesterday, is to freeze. What well, Nathan, here's what I'm going to do real quickly. I'm going to show the trailer of that movie right here, right now for us. Um, I'm hoping everybody takes a second. Here we go. It's perfect. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, Mr. Goodson. Back to Mexico if this cold keeps up. Welcome to the downtown. It must be really nice to have a job where you get to sit around and read all day. It's all drunks and crazy people. Uh, sir, you're going to have to put your clothes back on. There are a bunch of guys fighting in the pit. Athena, I'm going to go. I leave when I'm damn good and ready. The unidentified homeless man was found dead just outside the doors of the public library. I heard two more people froze to death. It gets this cold? I don't know why they don't just let us stay here. In 10 minutes, the main library will be closing for the night. Mr. Griffith, I got to talk to you. There's not enough shelter for us people on the street. Who is us? There are a lot of cop cars here. Is everything all right? Patrons are staging an action. The library has not been sanctioned. An official emergency shelter. This is Detective Bill Ramston. Sooner or later, you're going to have to open that door. So now's probably not a great time to come and get my library card. Public library. Not a shelter for the homeless. People are freezing to death. It is my job to uphold the law and protect democracy in this city. These people that you're protecting, is it worth throwing your life away for? What's it going to be, Mr. Goodson? Either one of us or you're one of them. Why do all this? For what? And what if we still met? The biggest struggle here is knowing which side of right we're actually walking on. The public library is the last bastion of true democracy that we have in this country. God gives us all a voice. This time I'm going to fight back. All right. That right there, my friend, was powerful, buddy. Yeah. That All was right. very powerful. Yeah. I, I was I was deeply struck when I saw that ad and the times I rewatched it. Absolutely. Well, look, 
I think, oh, okay. I think you see the can see the direct connection in terms of what I'm talking about. Absolutely. I I want to want to be real clear. I I I as as a guy who gets the opportunity to interview a lot of different people and is trying to start an organization to address things exactly like that. You know, my breath is taken away because you know what? This is no joke. Our movement is so full of people that just want to gather groups up and hang out at some local latte shop and, and talk about the resistance. That right there, my friend, is what we're fighting for. And that's why we talk economics on this this program, this group, so goddamn often. And I'm so goddamn bitter at these shallow, thimble-deep, beautiful people, lots of makeup, lots of glitz and glamour, and very, very low on the actual usefulness. And, and it's gotten to a point, it's gotten to a fever pitch with the beautiful people trying to guide this goddamn revolution. And I'm watching that. And I am enraged, enraged that they are the ones that get the front and center because they're still the beautiful people. I mean, this just disgusts me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite put it, put it that way. Uh, I, I would say that, you know, you know, there's certain, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a number of things. There's, you know, what's happening on social media. There's what's happening in the mainstream media. And of course, you know, especially, you know, TV is a visual meeting medium. So it's going to be, you know, more about who can present well in a, in a small, concise period of time. And, you know, frankly, also who, who looks good in, uh, on, on the camera, on, especially on short notice in terms of what you're talking about guests. But um, in terms of what's, but that all is all in a lot of ways, you know, we, we should try to make interactions in those conversations, but uh, though that in a lot of ways is, uh, is, 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 I think a little bit of a tangential, a little bit of a, of, of a distraction and that there's a ton of people, you know, in, you know, in concrete organizing, organizing tenant unions, organizing and uh, organizing things uh, at, at, local level at the state level you know some on the, on the federal level some on congressional they're you know putting the work in and you don't see them on the me uh on you know even just on the social media tours because they're working on other stuff and of course and also you know there are people who haven't had the time of you know that the community around mmn has in terms of uh exploring exploring things from and i don't mean this in a negative sense i mean this in a very positive sense the the theoretical aspects of this so to me um when you when you have a particular person and you have a particular thing where you think they're saying something that is wrong and is is dangerously wrong and they're representing them as a liberal themselves as a liberal and leftist you know go at them but in terms of how you think about how you know how you're presenting what we're talking about generally you know especially as someone who's lives in New York City and is interacting, you know, concretely with groups, especially um, as DSA is starting to do a big push on on doing New York City a uh, housing organization, that you have to, th that especially that kind of concrete, you know, municipal city, your community organizing, you have to think in terms of, I have been lucky enough to, you know, have been able to spend the time on a theoretical apparatus and, and a way of approaching these issues in a holistic way. and I can catch someone up to speed very quickly and I have to see myself in the way MMN very much sees itself. Modern Money Network sees itself as, you know, the, as, as the, as an intellectual wing, uh, able to provide support. And over the last couple of years, uh, especially, um, more, and, there's, there's more and more, you know, local or left-wing organizing groups who recognize us as such all the time. And I think we're in a period of growth and uh, where we're getting more and more recognition and more and more attention to what we have to say on these various topics. And I think we should just be thinking in terms of focusing on that, on, on that growth when we're making general statements about what's going on and what's going on in, uh, in, in these currents. And, you know, sometimes you just have to take someone down, whether it's on Twitter or on Facebook, but that's, you know, a particular isolated thing that, I, there, there's an easy way to tell the story where those things are important. In some ways, they are, but my focus, and I think MMN's focus, is on the 
organizations that we're uh, becoming attached, uh, becoming more and more attached to. And you guys are doing God's mind. work. You guys are an integral part in a growing future of literacy, and and you take action. You guys don't waste time. You guys really are in the mix. And I applaud you. I salute you. You guys are my heroes. I, I really appreciate the effort. You know, and I want to tell folks that don't know about you all enough, you know, that come to our program, you guys are volunteers. And when you guys do what you say, you say you're going to do something. There are a lot of volunteers out there that take this as very, very blase. They just sort of show up when they want. They do. You guys literally deliver every single time you say you're going to do something. You guys actually do what you say. And, and I just, I have so much respect for you all. So much respect. We, we, we appreciate that a ton. And we appreciate, appreciate uh, your, your side of that, especially the MMT conference, especially, you know, just on a concrete level, had access to things in an immediate way that, you know, took a while to have access in any other, in any other venue. Uh, and I would also, uh, you know, I, it, it occurs to me, you know, I should be taking this moment to do, you know, our own plugging opportunity. MMN is doing an event that I believe, I'm pretty sure will be live streamed, but, you know, we'll check the Facebook events. I'll, I'll send it over with Jesse Isinger about his book, The Chicken Shit Club, about the lack of uh, prosecutions uh, as a result of the financial crisis uh, in New York City at the New School on uh, this upcoming Thursday. I believe that's the 14th and we're going to have um, someone who's connected, someone who's connecting us uh, moderating uh, uh, who goes on uh, Facebook, Facebook as Vanessa B who uh, is, uh, who, who works at the CFPB and uh, we, and uh, we brought, we're going to be bringing uh, Bill Black uh, to be a discussant who you can imagine will have a lot to say about, what Jesse has to say in terms of the lack of prosecutions. And so I think that will, that event is going to be in a, I should remember, um, uh, say Jesse Eisinger is uh, from ProPublica, uh, the you know, kind of leading nonprofit journalism outfit. And I think that event is going to be uh, extremely good where we're going to have a live stream set up. And so please uh, check that out and feel free to come out if you're uh, hap happen to be lucky enough in New York City. Awesome. All right, buddy. Look, I'm going to let you get out of here, man. Thank you so much for the time. I appreciate it immensely. I look forward to our next opportunity to talk, buddy. Yep. Talk to Have you. A good, yep. All right, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you soon.